This here is Rob Tubber for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. Delighted to be joined by unbeaten super bantamweight giant, Hopi Price. We're here in, um, I'd say sunny old Rotherham, but it's not quite. But we're here in Rotherham, it's very cold. How you doing, Hopi? Nice to see you. Yeah, I'm not too bad, are you? Not bad, thank you. Not bad. How was your Christmas and New Year? Uh, it wasn't too bad. Um, I had a little break, but apart from being a bit, a little bit ill of Christmas, um, I'm back all right now, back in the gym training, so all good. What's it like for fighters around Christmas? Because obviously you have to be somewhat wary of your diet. Are you are you a runner on Christmas Day? Are you a runner after the Queen's speech? What do you do? I think everyone's running on Christmas Day, but um, for the past couple of years, like you say, I've only just turned pro, so the championships is almost straight after Christmas. So I'm always training like flat out of Christmas and all break. So I think this year, for the first time, I had like a week off the gym and just just been a normal kid like you say, I'm only 19. So just, just done what a normal 19 year old would do of Christmas. What was that? I think Dave's still around, so keep it quiet if it's anything that you shouldn't have been doing. But what oh. were you doing with your downtime? In a couple of strip clubs and whatever <laughs> else. Uh. <laughs> I am, I am, I am. I might not look old enough, but don't worry, I got my ID. <laughs> For all of the uh, the owners of various gentlemen clubs in Rotherham area, just keep an eye on Hopi Price. Uh, you know what these fighters can be like. So... 2020 is here. First, let's go back. Last time I saw you was in uh, Saudi Arabia, where you picked up your second career victory as a professional. Now you've had a little bit of time to digest the whole experience, because I'd imagine it was a little bit of a blur. What was it like boxing on the Anthony Joshua Andy Ruiz undercard? You know what? It was an unbelievable experience for me. Um, like I say, just the team around me must have confidence in me. Like I say, Dave and Eddie and Matt Trim and the guys at Sky Sports, because they wouldn't give me that, that slot on the bill. Um, a lot of young fighters may get to box on an undercard of a big show, but not to be live on TV. And um, I just felt like um, I thrived under the pressure, to be honest. I, I enjoyed pressure and I enjoyed it. Second fight as a professional, was there a, was there a notable difference? Did you feel a little bit different from your professional debut? A lot of fighters can go into that first fight and they're a little bit tense because it's their yeah. debut. Was there a difference for you between the first and second fight? No, to be honest, I, felt, I did feel a bit more relaxed because I knew it was more of what was going on before the fight. The, the like all the, the leading up to it and everything I was more prepared this time than I was for my debut but as far as the boxing I think I'm always the same I'm, I'm quite relaxed when it comes to boxing so I just got in there and took my time and done what I had to do Now we'll speak about your amateur um, background a little bit um, as we come forward but before we do that how are you finding the transition I'm always fascinated to speak to guys who have had like a had notable success as amateurs whether it be you know obviously yours was youth Olympics whether it's youth Olympics seniors or whatever yeah. And it's different for different fighters. How are you finding the transition? Uh, I, th I think I've talked to it very well. Um, I think Dave's a big part of, of that, though, but helping me with the transition. I think I think too many people say there's too big of a difference, which if you look at the top fighters now in world boxing, which is like Lamanchenko and Alexander Usyk and that, and even Anthony Joshua, they all was top amateur Olympic gold medalists. So I think some of them are still doing what they're doing as amateur, but they've found a way to do it for 12 rounds and just tweak little things like towards the professionals which you have to do and I think it's working so I think Dave's helping me a lot by doing that learning me the, the little tricks and, and a, little, a few new things but I think as far as like footwork and still things like that he's saying like keep it keep it as, as it is so I think it's all good now again let's touch upon that kind of the success that you had as an amateur first ever um, youth gold medalist, um, which I'm sure was fantastic for yourself. Um, was there ever any temptation? I mean, I've, I've gone back and read articles that you'd yeah. done a long time ago and kind of newspaper interviews where you spoke about one day wanting to win and go to the Olympic Games, but it hasn't quite happened that way. Or yeah. It didn't quite happen that way. What was the reason for that? Um, well, like you say, I always wanted to go to the Olympics. From a young kid, I just wanted to be an Olympic champion. And I never knew there was a Youth Olympic Games because I think 2010 was the first year they ever brought it in. So... From maybe like 14, 15, I was getting put in the newspapers like, oh, he's going to go to the Olympics because I was literally clearing up in, on like domestic scene as an amateur. And then just like um, 2018 was a good year for me. It was a big year. So first of all, to even qualify, you had to win gold in the European Championships. So it was literally the gold medalist of every continent's champion. So when I won that, there was a bit of pressure off. But obviously, European champions is a big thing. Not many people win it, so... I kept going, went to the World Championships and I got a silver medal, but a few people and I got stitched up in the final. Mm. And then obviously I won the Youth Olympic Games. I was the first ever Brit to do it, so I thought rarely. I seen like the boys from the other countries, maybe like Russia and that. As soon as they went home, maybe two, three weeks later, they got put onto their team because I knew the Olympics was only two years away. 
and start getting prepared for like a qualifying maybe or at least get given a chance. And it was just like um, I never got given give much of an opportunity. They left me from maybe October to after Christmas. They said, oh, I'll come back after Christmas. So to have, for me to have a couple of months off, off the gym, like you say, I can't box domestic in Norway. I can only box in major competitions. And I literally won everything. And I was like, I couldn't do not. I was stuck in the mud. I couldn't train. I want training. And then when I did go on the assessment, I was done everything they asked me to do and like that. And then they just kept sort of hold. To me, they was holding it off. So it was like, by the times I did get on the team, it had been too late. And I wanted to try and qualify for Tokyo. I had a box off with any of them to try and get that spot. But I didn't want to wait another six years and to 2024. I think I'd be too old. I think by the time 2024 is here, I can established myself a, a big name in the professional ranks, so I just went down to all the routes trying to find a way to be a professional boxer. Was that something that was easy to kind of put to one side? I mean, you think about going to the Olympics and, and throughout your amateur career, and then all of a sudden that doesn't happen and then you go professional. Was it was it easy to put that to one side? No, definitely not. Um, like you say, from October till June, I think it was June I come to Dave, I, I, I didn't really train much. Um, I never boxed like until I had my pro debut. It was over a year since I last got in a ring. So for me, it was very frustrating. As as a kid, I'd be boxing, I'd be in the gym sparring day in day out, and always in competitions all over the world. And I did want to go to the Olympics, but I sort of just I sort of come to terms with quicker thing to myself. It's not meant to be. Um, if anything, it's not my fault because the way I see it is, I only won. I won more than anyone else as a youth boxer and junior. Like our uh, British is most successful amateur. So I thought, I can't do any more, so if they don't want me on the team, then it is what it is. I'm just, I have done it for long, so i sort of go and try and make me mark in the professional ranks and do what I've done as an amateur, win as many titles as possible. And as you say, you ended up with Dave Coldwell here in sunny old Rotherham. Um, what was it that it attracted you to come to train with Dave? Obviously, Dave's had numerous success stories throughout the years. Was there anything in particular that you'd seen in the past, or was it just, you know, you fit? For me, I always watched professional boxing, but I was that concentrating on going to the Olympics. I used to just watch everyone as amateur. I watched every amateur competition, everything. Whereas my dad, he was he was my amateur coach and he had a big influence on my career. And it was actually my dad what wanted me to go train with Dave. So um took a bit of persuading. We had to get um, my mates, Charles Franklin's dad, and um, he gave Dave a text and Dave said, didn't really want that many fights at the time, but he said, um, yeah, come down, I'll have a look at you. And then, after that, I think we just we clicked. We've done a, a pad session and we clicked. So I'm happy to be in this gym. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. You mentioned your dad. Again, that's something that kind of came up in, in previous things that I'd read about you. How big of an influence was he in your career? Was it was because you are of a, we'll come on to this, you are of a traveller background. Boxing, fighting in, in the traveller background and the traveller community is huge. I mean, you have to look at your Tyson Furies, Billy Joe Saunders, Andy Lee, etc. How big of an influence was your dad? And was he always kind of pushing you towards boxing? Yeah, well... It's actually a funny story, but my first ever present when I was born was boxing goods, like I said, my whole family boxed. So I think ever since being been a young kid, like I'm talking very young, like 18 month old, I knew all the all the shots on the pads and he sort of set me out to train me and I think I went to the boxing club about four or five. And I actually started an amateur club and he used to watch like through the window obviously on the coach and um the coach just assumed like he had a gist he knew what he knew what he was talking about, so he was a club coach and then once then he, he trained me ever since and like say um, a big thanks to him not just I've won every single title amateur and I remember I used to every time I won a medal I say that's yours because uh, without him I wouldn't have been able to do it um, like you say a lot of young kids is, we didn't go to school so I had to go to work but he'd always if I had to if he had to go off a job to take me to the boxing club he would so like say now um, hopefully I start reaping the reward soon and can pay about something. Now, you're all part of this kind of, this next generation, this new wave. You mentioned Charlie Frankham, who's turned over, I think he turned over last year, didn't he, as a professional. There's yourself, there's Dennis McCann, also from a traveller background. Try and explain to us, if you can, what it means to be a fighter or a boxer and how important is that role in the traveller community? Well, it's very big, like you say, because it's more to the point every young kid, every dad wants their son to be a boxer. Like, years ago it was fighting, so they all said, oh, I'm not like, it's more of like a, a family name thing. So in the travelling community, you get a very big name if, you, if you're a good boxer. And like you said, schoolboy championships, it's always packed of young travelling kids. But it's more, I think, when they hit 16, 17 and start driving that, they all sort of drift away from the sport. I think Billy Joe and Tyson has showed that they can be, you can like do very good in, in boxing, not just 
by working as, as our usual trade. So I think a lot of the boys is trying to emulate what they've done and go on. And I think it's good now that you see of um, a lot of young kids, like say uh, Charles Frank and Dennis McCann, who are good mates of them. We've boxed as amateurs together. And now we're trying to go onto the professional route and, and win titles because I think sometimes we get all times with the same brush. I think sometimes we get a bad name. So I think it'd be good to us now, like we're on, on TV and, and doing these interviews and people can watch and see that we're just we're just the same as everyone else. Um, like we're just nice kids and, and, and the same thing. Um, and I think it might change people's people's um, views on, on, on travellers. You mentioned Tyson Fury and Billy Joe Saunders, obviously two very high profile boxers from a travelling background. Were they the kind of the influences on you for the fighters that you used to watch or were there other fighters that took your eye when you were coming up? Um, I watched all fighting, but um, like you say, maybe when I was like eight years old, seven, there was Billy Joe Saunders went to the Olympic Games and um, I had a cousin who was on the Olympic team with him. So I was always, I was always around it. And obviously seeing them go there, that made me want to go to the Olympics, mm. being eight years old. And then, like I said, when I seen them start winning all the titles as professional, I thought it can be done. I, I want to do that, and I've won like as much as them in the amateur games. So I think, why can't I do as a pro? So yeah, I, I do look up to them. I like I do all, all fighters, the top fighters. Uh, Lamachenko was a big one as well. I used to watch as when he was amateur, and now as a professional, he's probably my favourite fighter at the minute. Best fighter in the world. Best fighter in the world, I think definitely. I agree with you. Um, before I let you go, because I understand you have to go and catch a train. Um, Talk to me about 2020. You're going to be back on February the 8th in Sheffield with your third fight in four months. I spoke to Dave in Saudi Arabia. He said the plan for you is no pressure just to get you out as much as possible this year. Do you agree with that or does the fighter inside you want to push on this year? Um, I'll just listen to Dave and do whatever he says, really. Um, He sets the fights and I'll do the boxing. Um, Like you say, just keep busy this year and keep improving. I think that's the main thing. And if I keep doing that and keep getting on these good shows and keep performing, then by the end of the year, hopefully I'll be known as one of the best prospects in, in world boxing and that's my goal for the end of the year. Okay, actually, there was something else I wanted to ask you about before we went. Ivan. Ivan Price. Now, a lot of people who are watching this something that would be titled Hopey Price. Yeah. Tell us about, because your name is Ivan Price. Where does it come from? Hopey is, Hopi your, Hopi your middle, is your middle name. Tell us about the origins of, of your name, as it were. Well, uh, I've got the exact same name as, as my dad. We've got exactly the same name, so... My dad's always been called Hopi as well, off his parents, everyone else. So when I was born, I was getting called after my dad, which was Hopi, but on the birth certificate. So it was exactly the same as my dad's, it got put as Ivan. So funny story is I didn't really know I was called Ivan until, like I said, I was about seven and eight. And uh, <laughs> I went to the doctors and the woman, I was with my mum and she shouted, they shouted down, um, oh, Ivan. And she said, come on. I said, no, it's not me. I said, my name's Hopi. And she said, that's your name. So... Like you say, I always got called Hopi, but when I went to like amateur competitions, my name was Ivan because it was on my passport, my medical book. And um, I come to the gym and the boys didn't know at first because I didn't really say much to them. I just said my name's Hopi. And Dave and that never knew. And when it come to it's like um, getting all the license and everything, they seen my actual name and I think that's why they give me the name Drago. So <laughs> it's stuck. Yeah, it's quite, it goes hand in hand, doesn't it? You see somebody called Ivan, you're a boxer. Ivan Drago. Um, okay, well, Hopi Price, thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social, having me down to the gym here today. Um, looked in fine form and look forward to seeing you back in the ring on February the 8th in Sheffield. Thank you very much for your time.